The Curl Lectureship is offered every two years to a person who shows exceptional promise in developing their career. Maxime Brami, who is our speaker tonight, is regarded by many as one of the most brilliant young scholars of his generation. Dr. Brami was educated in Paris. He then came to study in the UK, where he obtained a first class degree in anthropology and archaeology from the University of Bristol and completed his doctorate at the University of Liverpool. He then moved to the University of Vienna for his first postdoc, followed by a second at Mainz, where he became subsequently a Marie Curie Fellow and presently is director of a DFG project at that university. Dr. Brami, though still at the outset of his career, has pursued three overlapping investigations. The archaeological investigation of diffusion in the Neolithic Revolution, disciplinary history of archaeology and anthropology, in particular the works of Gordon Child, and finally, the emerging field of ancient DNA. Additionally, since the very outset of his academic studies, he has sought to build up experience in the field and is now a seasoned excavator of prehistoric sites in Anatolia and the Balkans. He is one of the very few scholars who are prepared truly to internalize insights from both anthropology in all its branches and is equally comfortable with working with the British, French and German academic traditions. Maxime's current DFG project, Cultures on the Move, New Approaches to Archaeology and Genetics of, of Yamnaya to Corded Ware Burial Transition, brings all these different considerations together. In the prosaic prose of research proposals, it aims to revisit systematically cultural taxonomies in Central and Eastern Europe and explicitly test the presumed co-dispersal of step-derived pastoralists with new burial practices and artefacts. In fact, in more everyday language, it promises to change our understanding of some of our most well-cherished assumptions as to how the prehistoric record of Europe should be understood. Prompt in publishing and devoted to his profession, both in the lab and in the field, one who works across anthropology and archaeology in original ways. We are greatly privileged that Dr. Brami can be with us tonight to deliver the 2023 Curl Lecture in 2022, she says, looking at David. It is an honour and it's probably a first that we've had a lecture that's a year in advance. You are so very welcome. The stage is yours. Thank you, Dr. Brami. Um, thank you so much. Um, it is, it is a, a tremendous honor and a great pleasure for me to be here today. Um, and I really wish to thank the REI uh, and David Shankman especially for inviting me. Um, so I just also wish to say that um, I believe we are here about halfway between University College and the London School of Economics. Uh, about 100 years ago, we would have been right at the center of uh, the diffusion controversy between Malinowski and uh, Grafton Elliot Smith, Grafton Elliot Smith being at the anatomy building of, um, of uh, UCL and Malinowski being at the London School of Economics. And I believe the REI was right at the center also of that uh, conflict. Uh, so, um, I mean, for me, uh, the REI, it's very interesting because over the, the recent years, it has begun to reassess uh, the legacy uh, of the British School of, of Diffusionism and its influence both on the development of uh, social anthropology in Britain and on European prehistory. Uh, so uh, prehistoric archaeology and social anthropology uh, and also ethnology, as we learned last week, uh, there, was a, there was a panel that was organized uh, also at the REI uh, on Austrian diffusionism, the, the Kulturkreislehre uh, of Fritz Grebner. Um, this discipline, they used to be very close together. And I think they really began to diverge more following the diffusion controversy from the 1920s. Uh, so you could think of people like uh, Gordon Schall that I will talk about today also uh, as, as being anthropologists uh, in, in many ways. Uh, so yeah, I will, I will return to, that, uh, to the diffusion controversy of the 1920s. Uh, but first of all, what I want to say is um, as an undergraduate student at the University of Bristol back in 2005, I learned from my tutor at the time, uh, Dr. David Schenkeland, uh, that diffusion isn't used very much at all in social anthropology today. 
Uh, and um, in prehistoric archaeology, which is the area that I work in, I would say people are more ambivalent towards this concept of diffusion. Some people are, yes, some people think that there is diffusion, some people not. Uh, it's, it's more ambivalent. And in other disciplines, like population genetics or population genetics using ancient DNA data, which I will also talk about today, um, there seems to be no problem with diffusion. And in fact, everything is framed in terms of uh, either demic diffusion or cultural diffusion, demic diffusion involving some uh, migration. So in other words, diffusion is one of those key concepts that I would say most clearly separate the different branches of uh, anthropology. And therefore, it is interesting. Uh, and so I will illustrate this by providing some examples from my own research uh, on the diffusion of Neolithic practices, but I have to explain what, uh, what I mean by Neolithic practices. Uh, and, and the point that I wish to make is, is very simple. Uh, diffusion is about contact, uh, but diffusion is also about context. Uh, and Malinowski was almost certainly right when he asserted 100 years ago that diffusion is always a form of reinvention. It is always a form of adaptation to the local uh, context and so on. But that assumes that uh, the changes are mainly happening within set cultures or internally. And I think what we see now with prehistoric archaeology and ancient DNA is that um, a lot of a lot of practices and so on were also sort of moving. And so I, the question is, is it time perhaps to rethink diffusion and the role of, of uh, migration and diffusion of culture? Um, I'm not sure, but uh, we will see. Um, OK, that works. Um, so, so for those of you who don't uh, know what the Neolithic uh, is, um, the Neolithic is probably one of the most important revolutions in human history uh, because it is when um, food gatherers became food producers. Uh, and this is, I mean, we have known this since the, the 19th century, but um, I've been especially interested in the work of uh, Vere Gordenschall that you see on the, on the left-hand side here. Uh, he, he used to be the librarian of the REI in 1925. Uh, and... I think this is where he launched his, his stellar career form as, a, as librarian of the REI. Uh, and in 1936, he published this book, uh, this popular book called Man Makes Himself, uh, in which he described the three revolutions in, uh, in history, uh, the Neolithic, the urban, and the industrial uh, revolution. Uh, and he described the Neolithic revolution as the first revolution that transformed human economy and gave man control of his own food supply. So it's about food production, but it is also about uh, scales of production. So in a Neolithic or a domestic economy, the goods are produced where they are consumed in the same kind of household. Uh, in an urban or uh, a town economy, the idea is that there are many hands between producers and consumers. And in an industrial or a national economy, the idea was that uh, the goods can be produced in one part of the country and they can be consumed in another part of the country. And of course, you could, you could think of the next stage as being a global economy where the goods are produced in one country and then consumed in another. So it is a very evolutionist uh, kind of scheme. Uh, and at the time, Gordon Schild um, described this as progress. Um, now, other historians, I, I include here this chart from uh, Ian Morris. And I, um, so this is... Um, a historian where he tried to quantify uh, progress, or he calls it social development. Uh, don't ask me how it is done, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, the way, what you can see is that you can see how the three revolutions kind of match onto that uh, diagram quite neatly. So I would say historians are still grappling with this uh, concept of uh, three revolutions. Um, and there are, of course, many, many, many things which are implicated uh, or entangled with uh, a Neolithic mode of production. Uh, and that includes um, storage, uh, sedentism, uh, settled village life, and so on. And I will focus more on the settled village life aspect uh, today. Um, so, 
So I've, I've so packed it. It's a very it's full, talk. full talk. Uh, so I apologize so in advance. I have a lot of slides. Um, but uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to give you some background on my uh, research on Neolithic practices uh, and the diffusion of Neolithic practices. And, and then you will see that there's a, there's a problem. There was a site when I was doing my PhD that didn't really fit. I did not understand it. Uh, so, so, and I was very fortunate later on to be able to revisit this evidence using ancient DNA. Uh, and at the end of my talk, I will just make a few comments about uh, the diffusion controversy. So I return to it, uh, to that old debate from the 1920s. And you will see um, at that point whether it is useful or not to return to that, to that concept. Um, okay, so I'll start with the Neolithic uh, mode of behavior. Um, so, I don't know if all of you can see properly, but um, this is one of the most recent maps that archaeologists kind of come up with when they talk about the spread of farming into Europe, the spread of agriculture. Um, the idea is that European agriculture originated in the Near East, where uh, sheep, goat, cattle and pigs, wheat, barley, and many other species of uh, wheat and so on were domesticated for the first time. Uh, and, um, and what we see is, uh, is the process where this package or packages are being sort of brought into uh, different parts of Europe. So this is a map from uh, Detlef Gronenborn, a colleague from, from Mainz. And for some of, so some of the uh, species, uh, like the ovicaprids, we have no wild progenitors in parts of Europe, so we know that they are definitely coming from, uh, from the Near East. Okay. And I, I want to start with um, uh, a site called Chateliuk, because I've been, I think we've heard from Chateliuk before, but uh, I've been extremely fortunate uh, as an undergraduate student to, to work there, uh, and I think that really kind of framed the way I, I thought about uh, archaeology and, um, and, and so on. Uh, so here you can see a reconstruction of that settlement of uh, Chateliuk, it's a Neolithic settlement. Uh, so one of these farming communities uh, in the central Anatolian plateau. So it is a high plateau about 1,000 meters above sea level and it is surrounded by high mountains. And what you can see is a, is a tightly agglutinated settlement with a lot of um, rectangular houses uh, and there are no streets. <coughs> so um, that means that the houses were probably only accessed through the roof uh, via ladders, which created all sorts of problems. If you think about it, you have to go, uh, you have to use your neighbor's roofs to sort of go to other, uh, yeah, to, to, to your house. Uh, and this is a site which has been excavated first by uh, James Mellart back in the 1960s. James Mellart was at UCL. Uh, and then uh, it was revisited by uh, Ian Hodder for 25 years uh, in the 1990s. And I was part of, uh, uh, as a student assistant, I was able to, uh, to attend a couple of seasons there. Uh, and for instance, this is one house that I, I was able to work in uh, together with, uh, so this was excavated by Shaina Farid, who was at the time the uh, site director, uh, Rodi Regan, and, and others. And I was just a, a student assistant there, but what we were doing was excavate the, uh, the infill of uh, the building. And I show you this house because what you can see is that it really looks like a house, uh, which is incredible. Uh, so, I don't know if you can see properly, but the walls are, okay, that doesn't work, but you can see the walls are preserved almost two meters on one side. Uh, on the right hand side, you see a kind of domed oven. Okay. Uh, and there are platforms. The platforms would have been used for sleeping. Uh, and we know that they were burying the dead beneath the platforms. So in fact, in this house, in a subsequent uh, uh, season, they were able to excavate several burials underneath the floors of uh, the house. And yeah, and the reason why it is so well preserved there's a reason for it, because archaeologically, this is 9,000 years old or 8,500 years old. You would not expect a house to look like this after that period of time. The reason why it was so well preserved is because it was intentionally burnt, and then it was intentionally infilled. So a lot of soil was taken from outside the mound, brought into this house to infill almost all the way to the top. 
Uh, and, and that created a kind of stable platform to build a new house on top. So, so I think the broader ambition of, uh, of the Chatelier Research Project, uh, if I may characterize it like this, was to write a kind of ethnography of uh, Neolithic practices, bearing in mind that uh, all our informants were long dead and that they left no written records. So all we had was this kind of things, like houses, uh, and they are incredibly repetitive. I mean, all the houses kind of look like this. I mean, some of them are um, maybe not that high, maybe they're only 40 or 50 uh, centimeters kind of preserved, but you see again houses and houses and houses. So, uh, and, and, and this idea that you can use the space and you can use um, the houses to really think about um, the society and the practices, I think that came from uh, the sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, especially, and his work on practice theory, uh, where, um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this book, uh, The Kabyle House or The World Reversed. In this book, he talks about the interior space of the Kabyle House and the um, kind of differences between men and women. Uh, and he interprets the whole Kabyle society based on the architecture and the interior space of uh, the buildings. And I would say it's probably very similar to the ambition of um, uh, Ian Hodder that you see in the, in the right hand corner there. Uh, when he wrote, for instance, uh, The Leopard's Tale, he was he was talking, I mean, he, he writes extensively about these buildings being always kind of used in the same, in the same way. They have the same arrangement. Uh, so uh, mostly they are entered from the south uh, through a ladder over the kind of fireplace. Uh, and this part of the house is the dirty, what he calls the dirty area. So you have a lot of platforms which are um, so you have a lot of like really f uh, fine floors, but uh, they are there's a lot of dirt trapped in between these floors. And as you progress to the back of the houses, uh, towards the north area, and especially the northeast corner, this is where you see a lot more symbolic activity, uh, evidence for burial activities, and so on. Okay? So um, if, we, if we had to characterize this kind of archaeology again, uh, and this is what I, what I was trained to do, right? This was about what people do. It's about their practices. So it is uh, material practice based. It's highly contextual. I think this is the important aspect. And it's about the small scale, sometimes even the household uh, level. Uh, and you could say it's about everyday life and everyday life changes. Uh, so it's about the slow internal change of uh, the society. So it's really focusing on a couple of houses at the side of Chetaduk. I mean, um, of course, um, it's not the entire project. I mean, there are many diverse uh, interests in that project, but this is at least how I learned to do archaeology by working at Chateauguay. And again, I, I was very fortunate to to be involved as a as a student assistant there. But um, at the time when uh, Chateauguay, when this project, when 25 years of Ian Hodder were uh, going on, there were other sites in Anatolia that were being excavated, also Neolithic sites. Uh, sites in central Turkey, in western Turkey, uh, and I was involved in different projects. And what I realized at the time is that a lot of the practices that were observed at Chedadaliuk, you could actually trace them onto these other sites as well. They were present in other sites, so uh, things like uh, the deliberate infilling of houses, the deliberate burning of houses, uh, the, the idea that you have houses which are built right on top of the other. So we have this really complex photographies. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see here. Yeah. Um, so you see there are like walls, uh, walls of houses which are built on top of like previous walls of houses. And you end up with big settlement mounds which are sometimes, I don't know, 20 meters in height, uh, I believe, for Chateliuk. Uh, and um, they are also elaborate subfloor burials. The subfloor burials are, tend to be in contracted position on one side. So all of these practices, you could say, they seem to be associated with the first farming communities, with these Neolithic communities in uh, Anatolia. And in fact, you could trace them even further because uh, as you go to Greece, Neolithic Greece, you see them as well. So in, in early Neolithic uh, settlements, 
there are houses which are built on top of previous houses or which are inserted into, into previous houses. And so you could document many of these practices um, all the way from the Near East into Europe, and they seem to accompany the first uh, farmers, interestingly. Uh, so this one example here, we documented a uh, practice at another site, this is North Chateliuk, uh, a site called Shukuritshiriuk, which is near Ephesus. It's part of the Ephesus landscape in uh, southwest, uh, southwest Turkey, on the Aegean coast of Turkey. And you can see uh, so one house that was inserted into a previous house, which was already built on, a, on another house. Uh, so anyway, this is one practice, but we see it again and again and again in uh, this uh, Neolithic uh, communities. Um, OK, so when I was doing this, this was the work for my, for my PhD. So it was back in, uh, I finished in 2014. Uh, I had a problem. There was one site, uh, there was one region that did not really fit. Uh, I have to say it like this because at the time I did not understand it at all. Uh, and this was going a bit further into Europe. As you progress to the uh, central Balkans, you arrive on the Danube. And the Danube, as you know, is the highway of prehistory. So everything was going via the, the Danube. So in the Danube, on the border between Serbia and Romania, there's an extraordinary amount of uh, uh, sites, burials, and so on, which are dating from the 10th millennium all the way to the 6th millennium BC. I think there are about 700 burials that have been excavated to date from this period. So this is what it looks like, the, the Iron Gate. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe some of you have, have been there. Uh, you can see already by the geographic location, you see high mountains kind of going into the river. There's no real space or no real hinterland for agriculture. So it's not a place that is very suitable for uh, farming. But in this environment, there was, as I said, like an extraordinary flourishing of Mesolithic, Neolithic communities, Mesolithic communities being uh, foragers, so fishers or hunters or gatherers and so on, especially fishers here. And, and one site, which to me was a complete puzzle, was the site of Lepanskivir. Lepanskivir um, was excavated more or less at the same time as Tretaliuk by Dragoslav Srejovic. And um, I don't know if you can see it very well, but it's right in the center of this Iron Gate, this very spectacular landscape. Uh, it's on a slope uh, by the side of the river, and it was excavated as a, as a rescue excavation. So uh, the site did no, does no longer exist. I mean, it's submerged now, so you can't really go back and excavate again and find more, which is uh, a shame, because a lot of these questions would need to be, I think, revisited. Uh, but what you, what you will see at Lepanskivir is very elaborate houses, like Okay, they're not exactly like the ones at Chateliuk because they are trapezoidal, they're not exactly this rectangular shape, but they're very similar practices to uh, what I observed in Anatolia. This is what um, the current replica looks like. So if you go to Lepanskivir today, a bit higher up on the slope, they built a monument, a new museum uh, around this replica, so you can actually experience the space more or less as it was when it was uh, being excavated. Okay, but as I said, like a lot of the practices which I observed in Anatolia were present at Lepanski. Things like subfloor burials, or uh, the fact that they built houses on top of houses and so on. They also had a very elaborate pyrotechnology uh, because they were, uh, they constructed this limestone uh, floors, red limestone floors. And this we know from Neolithic sites also in Anatolia and from the Near East and so on. And so it has been a puzzle for archaeologists for a long time, in fact. I'm not the first one to notice that Lepanskivir is weird. And why is Lepanskivir weird? Because the context is completely different from, uh, from Chetaliuk. Here it looks like it could be uh, a fishing community, not a farming community, and it could be somehow, yeah, it could be somehow not related to the spread of farming, or it could be, yeah, but you will see, I mean, that. I think that model has been revisited, and I will, I will talk about this uh, now. So, for instance, Ian Hodder, in his book, uh, The Domestication of Europe, uh, published in 1990, 
he already made this parallels. So uh, he, he looked at uh, Tsiotaliuk and at Lepensky here, and I think he, that's how he opens up the book, in fact. He says, um, you have this incredible parallels in symbolic activities between the two sides, Tsiotaliuk, Lepensky here, but Tsiotaliuk has agriculture and Lepensky here doesn't. And in fact, I think he argues based on this that a lot of symbolic activities associated with uh, the domus uh, with domestic activities might be preceding the spread of agriculture uh, and might in fact help the spread of agriculture. But I'm not sure that really, that really works with the evidence that we have now because a lot of new evidence has come out and I, I want to talk about this uh, as well. Just to show you what uh, the settlement at Lepanskivia looks like, uh, this is a simplified map, but you can see it's completely organized. Uh, so uh, you have all these trapezoidal houses uh, and it looks like there was a predetermined plan when it was, when it was built. Uh, there's a, maybe a central house, maybe two central houses and some unbuilt spaces, one at the front, one in between uh, two big trapezoidal houses at the center. Um, and at the back you can see also an area that was maybe used as a, as a symmetry area. Would it be possible maybe to turn off the light? Uh, I just think maybe it's a bit too bright. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Um, OK. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, OK, so I just have to delve a bit into the archaeology of Lepanskivia, and I apologize in advance. But uh, the important thing is at Lepanskivia, there are three phases. And because there are three phases, it has attracted all sorts of ideas over the years. So first of all, there's a Mesolithic phase. Um, and it's actually, um, I think, it's dated from about 9,000 to 7,400 BC. Okay? And in that period, there was no settlement. There were no trapezoidal houses. So trapezoidal houses are later. Okay? But at that time, the site was visited by uh, hunters and gatherers, uh, officials, uh, they, there were some burial activities at the site, and uh, there were some fireplaces, external fireplaces, but it doesn't look like there were houses. Okay? Then we have a long hiatus of about a thousand years, and then suddenly, around 6200 BC, this settlement of Lepanski with the trapezoidal houses is constructed uh, and it's abrupt. Um, and suddenly we see all of those houses that are kind of constructed and several phases of them. Uh, and in these houses, pottery was already found, but it doesn't look like there was any agriculture as such. Uh, so food production, Neolithic, there are no domesticates that we know of. Okay, but at the time, I have to say, when the site was excavated in the, in the 1960s, they didn't look systematically for uh, you know, for bones and for, and for grains, okay? So that might still be in flux. Um, anyway, this uh, phase is often described as the phase of transition from Mesolithic to Neolithic or as the transformational phase. And then around 5,900 BC, it looks like the settlement with trapezoidal houses was completely abandoned. And then there were new houses that were constructed, pit houses and uh, quadrangular houses, and there were new types of burial activities at uh, the site. Uh, and this is when we see the first evidence for domesticates, uh, animal domesticates. Grains we don't know, uh, but uh, cattle, sheep, goat, and pigs are present, but they're still not so important in the, in the diet, okay? So because there are three phases, at Lepanski via a Mesolithic a transition phase and a Neolithic phase, it, it has looked, uh, or it looks like it could fit the model that was proposed already by uh, Marek Zvelebil, which was this idea of an availability phase. So foragers and farmers were kind of living on both sides of a farming frontier. And then the, the resources uh, were becoming gradually available to, uh, to the, the um, the foragers and the foragers were gradually adopting uh, agriculture. This was one early idea. Of course, we know since the 1990s that doesn't really work with uh, with Lepanskivia. And uh, also, if we look at continental level, we know that farming expansion was 
arrhythmic. Uh, so farming expansion happened really quickly in some regions, and then it stopped, and then it happened really quickly again. And maybe what you cannot see is that the intensity in somewhere in the, in the central Balkans uh, is not really on a key frontier area. So um, again, the Danube, probably a highway of prehistory. Um, now, things have began to change from the 1990s onwards. Uh, and this is not my work. This is the work of the people, um, especially Clive Bonso, Dushan Boric, uh, later Sofia Stevanovic, people who have revisited the evidence from Lepensky Vier based on the bones of the humans that were found at the site and other sites of the <laughs> Iron Gates. Uh, and what they used was um, this uh, carbon-nitrogen isotope, which we use archaeologically to determine the diet, what people were eating. And what it looks like is, okay, to make it very simple, but if you go from the 10th millennium BC onwards, you have this really high nitrogen isotope signatures, which might be associated with a marine diet. Uh, and we know that there are this... Um, Anadromous uh, fish, I think they're called, they're coming from the Black Sea and they have seasonal migrations. So it looks like throughout that period, in the Iron Gates, most people were consuming fish. Yeah? And then from about 6200 BC, so at the time when the first settlement at Lepenskivir was built with the trapezoidal houses, we see a, sh a sudden shift in this nitrogen isotope uh, signatures. So we see a drop, and this drop might be linked to um, a shift in diet, or the arrival of people who have um, a more terrestrial diet. And we don't know, we don't know what, what this is. We don't know because there are no domesticates, again, at that time, which is interesting. At the site, we find no domesticates, but the, 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 the people who are buried at the site of Lepenskivir, some of them, they look like typical farmers already by about 6,200 BC. So you can see what a puzzle that is. It's a really complex site. Um, now, to make things even more complex, I've talked about the Neolithic practices, the fact that there are uh, houses which are built on top of houses and so on. There are other things in that transitional phase with the trapezoidal houses that might suggest a more kind of local uh, background. Uh, so, um, so we see, I mean, the trapezoidal shape itself, uh, there are some pits, I'm, I'm not so convinced, but there are some pits which are slightly trapezoidal in other sites, earlier sites from the region. So it could be something local, we don't know. Uh, and what is clear on the other hand is that the, the burial activities during that transitional phase, the people were buried in extended supine position parallel to the Danube. And this type of burial is not typical for early Neolithic communities. In early Neolithic communities in Anatolia, in the Balkans, uh, they are mainly buried in contracted position on one side. So it's a completely different burial. And this type of burial practice, in fact, has been documented by, again, Clive Bonsall, Dushan Boric, and others in the late Mesolithic of the Iron Gates. Okay? So it looks like a mix of practices from foragers and farmers and so on. Now, in 2013, uh, there was an important study that was published by uh, Dushan Boric and Douglas Price where they looked at another isotope uh, called uh, strontium. And now it's not about diet, it's more about uh, where, it's about mobility, it's where people grew up, where they took up their, uh, so it's based on a kind of like geological signature and so on. And, and the idea is, again, throughout the 10th millennium, so if you go from the left of the, of the diagram towards the, the right of the diagram, what you see is all of the individuals seem to be contained within that local ranch. So they must have been growing up in the Iron Gates. Okay, so that's throughout the Mesolithic. And then from about 6,200 or 6,100 BC, again at the same time, suddenly we see people coming from outside. Or they seem to have grown up outside uh, the gorge. So that suggested that model, which I find very interesting, but I think it doesn't work, and I, I, I want to convince you also that it doesn't work, uh, of uh, Neolithic women joining a Mesolithic settlement, or marrying into a Mesolithic settlement, okay? Uh, and you can see, I don't know if you know this uh, illustration that was done for, I think, Scientific American, 
uh, where uh, you see a, a Neolithic woman in a bikini and she's uh, coming with agriculture and then the, uh, yeah, the, the, the forager is holding a fish, I think. So it's, uh, yeah. Anyway, this is what the model is about. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I want to list some of the expectations and show you why it doesn't work uh, with, uh, especially with ancient DNA. So, okay, so some of the expectations of that model is that uh, females are predominant uh, among incomers, okay? Uh, in fact, you would assume all of them to be, to be women. Uh, and uh, one thing which has been suggested by uh, Dushan, Boris, and others is that you have a dominance of the forager culture at the site because people are simply integrating into an existing uh, culture. Uh, and then you would also assume, because the women are coming with agriculture and contributing to the transition, that you see an adoption of farming practices by foragers. Okay, so these are simple expectations from that model. Okay, and now I have to talk about my involvement in ancient DNA and how I was able to revisit some of this uh, evidence. Um, and uh, for this, again, I have to, I have to thank uh, someone. I have to thank Joachim Burger, the boss, the head of the lab in Mainz that I work in, uh, because uh, first of all, uh, so I'm a prehistoric archaeologist, but I was involved in a network uh, that was organized by Joachim Burger back in 2012. Uh, which was called the Bean Project, uh, bridging the European and Anatolian Neolithic. And it was completely interdisciplinary. It was uh, demographers, archaeologists, geneticists, and so on. Uh, and then in 2018, I was able to join the lab uh, in Mainz with the Marie Curie Fellowship. Uh, and, and the idea was, okay, I'm not going to become a population geneticist using ancient DNA data because that would be impossible in two years, but I will do participant observation. So I will learn at least enough, I mean, I will learn the basics in molecular genetics, in population genetics, we work a bit in the lab, do the computer course and so on, so that I understand what my colleagues are doing. And then I can see how I can maybe integrate with uh, uh, with the approach and so on. So this was the idea. I have to say it was incredibly complicated. So in the first, in the first six months, I understood nothing. Uh, I, I, can, I can admit it now. I, I understood nothing. We had lab meetings on Monday and I was like, I don't understand. But my colleagues, they know. I mean, they, yeah, they could tell. Uh, so back in 2010, uh, 2018, sorry, this was the time when David Reich was uh, publishing his book, Who We Are and How We Got Here. David Reich is a Harvard geneticist, uh, and this book you might have seen attracted a lot of uh, discussion, controversy, and so on. Uh, but, um, and he, I mean, he had this interesting statement, we geneticists may be the barbarians coming late to the study of the human past, but it is always a bad idea to ignore barbarians. And I certainly felt at the time like I was learning a barbarian language. I mean, it was a completely, no, it is true, it is true. It was a completely different uh, language for me to, to, to understand. Um, and I mean, what I, what I realized then is that this was a completely different approach from what I'd been used to in prehistoric archaeology. So it wasn't about what people do, it was about who people are. It was non-material practice based. It was highly decontextualized. Initially, I'm not talking about ancient DNA in general, because in recent years, they have become more and more, they've, yeah, they've done more and more contextualized work. But in this particular book, I think it's highly decontextualized. Uh, and it was looking at things on a continental level or even a global level. And it was about these ideas of massive migrations. Uh, so you see a massive migration from there and another one and, and so on, and cultural change is happening through migration. So uh, the people come and they come with new ideas and they replace maybe the local population and they bring in new, new ideas, okay? So you can see it was, I would say, almost incompatible with the work I'd been used to at Chetaliuk. It was a completely different approach. It was a different world. Uh, then I realized that it is possible to reconcile them to some extent, but uh, at the time, difficult. Uh, okay, I won't try to explain the entire ancient DNA workflow because that would be impossible uh, now. But uh, I just want to say there are many disciplines which are involved in that particular workflow. And ancient DNA is all about contamination. So it's all about making sure that you avoid contamination. Uh, so you have to go in a clean lab uh, with, you know, like a 
suit and everything uh, to avoid your contaminating the samples with your own DNA uh, or DNA from outside. Uh, and um, so, so along the way, we are talking about physical anthropologists, we are talking about um, molecular geneticists, uh, we are talking about bioinformaticians, population geneticists. So it is quite a long process, in fact, to go from the bone to the statistical analysis. And one of the questions which is still unresolved, I would say, is where does archaeology fit in there? I mean, where do you... As archaeologists, where do we interact with uh, that workflow? Only at the start, at the end, at the start and at the end, or also along the entire uh, process, okay? Uh, and so that creates tensions also between archaeology and genetics. Uh, what I also learned in minds, and I think it's, this is very important, especially now with um, uh, the Nobel Prize awarded to Swan to Pebo, uh, and before I, I talked about David Reich, um, David Reich, I think, in his book, characterized the ancient DNA field as the new science of the human past, okay? Uh, and I think now, again, we see the Nobel Prize as this idea that we are creating a new discipline, yeah? And to some extent, it's true. But what I discovered in Mainz is that ancient DNA is the technique, is a new type of data, but the underlying science, population genetics, is in fact a whole branch of science, which has been around for over 100 years now. I, I wrote here one of the early studies, uh, Hirschfeld and Hirschfeld, on serological differences between the blood of different races uh, back in 1990. That was considered one of the first population genetics uh, study. Uh, and in fact, in archaeology, we've been aware of the models of population geneticists for a long time. So uh, already in the 1970s, uh, population geneticist Luca cavalli swarza suggested with archaeologist Albert Ammermann uh, a model of demic diffusion by wave of advance to explain the arrival of uh, farming in Europe. And the way they did this at the time was by comparing the uh, distribution of uh, the radiocarbon dates for first farming communities in Europe on the one hand, and on the other hand, look at uh, the modern distribution, or the distribution in modern European, so modern DNA, uh, of um, uh, specific uh, markers. And what they discovered at the time is that there is the same gradient from southeast to northwest uh, Europe. So they assume that it must indicate a kind of wave of advance uh, for uh, the spread of the Neolithic. And we know now, I mean, this evidence has been superseded. We don't really use that kind of evidence anymore. Uh, but um, but the idea was, was still, still used today, you could say. Uh, so one of, uh, one of the important papers to come out uh, in 2016 based on ancient DNA uh, is this one from, my, from the lab that I work in in Mainz. And this was one of the results of the, the BEAN project that I mentioned before. Uh, and, um, and this was now based on whole genome uh, data from uh, first farmers and from, uh, yeah, from first farmers from across Europe. And what they discovered at the time is that the first farmers from across Europe, they seem to be descendants or descendants from uh, the first farmers that lived in Anatolia and the Aegean Basin. So it looks like there is a discontinuity between the last foragers in Europe and the first uh, farmers. Okay? So this was shown quite con conclusively at that time already. Uh, and, um, and now we get to, uh, to the diagram that you have, and I have, to, I have to explain it, because I think this is, when you see ancient DNA studies uh, nowadays, they always have a PCA, okay? So uh, if you've never seen one before, I think it's a good opportunity now that I, I try to explain what is happening. Um, but first, I have to tell you just uh, something more, which is uh, another principle, key principle of population genetics, which is, that, um, which is called isolation by distance. Okay, so this is, for instance, uh, November et al. Uh, John November et al. in 2008, they published this very important uh, paper where I believe they genotyped uh, 3,000 modern Europeans and they specifically asked for people whose parents and grandparents were all born within the same country. Okay, so there was that's a bias from the start, but they wanted to avoid more recent migrations from the 20th century and so on. And what they discovered is once you plot each of these um, um, I mean uh, uh, genetic positions on 
uh, on the PCA, and I will talk about this PCA in a second, you almost rediscover a map of Europe. So, so in fact, I mean, genes mirror geography. Uh, genetic variation is continuous in humans, uh, and which is, I would say, by the way, a strong argument against uh, race uh, as a, a biological category when applied to humans. Uh, so you could say, just based on this, it's quite obvious you're more likely to have children with your neighbors than with people who are on the other side of the earth. So in fact, yeah, it's not, it's not saying a lot, but it's very important, uh, genes mirror geography. So you can read this PCA almost like a map. This is the important point. Okay, now I get to the PCA, and for this, I have to thank my colleague, uh, Johan Dickmann, who kindly provided this PCA, because it would be impossible for me to do them. Uh, so that's, again, I mean, telling you about the kind of technological know-how when you work with uh, uh, paleogeneticists, it's highly specialized, and there are people like my colleague, Johan Dickmann, who is um, um, like a very experienced data analyst, uh, and he's, he's done this for years. Uh, and, and so for him, it's easy, but for me, impossible. Uh, but uh, anyway, so I'll just say a few things about principal component analysis. So principal component analysis, which is what you're looking at now, and it's the same as uh, this diagram here. Uh, here, you can also only see the, the background population, which are the modern reference genomes, okay? Uh, so PCA, is a dimensionality reduction technique from data mining. And the aim is to visualize genetic variation. Okay, only visualize. So there is no analysis done, uh, you would say, beyond the PCA. Okay. And the way this is done is by reducing millions of variations of SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism, down to two dimensions. Okay, so in fact, you destroy a lot of information because you reduce the information down to two dimensions. And the way this works, the PCA selects, if you like, the two dimensions that contain most information or variation by rotating the coordinate system. Okay? It's very complex, and I don't, I'm not even sure I can explain it. But uh, what you see is each point here, each point is one modern or ancient individual. So you reduce the diversity from their genome in one point. Okay, so you can see, you can visualize one person. For this to work, you need about half a million variable DNA sites in the human genome. And you can see by the scale, maybe if you can read, that less than 2% of variation is captured in this PCA, but that is quite enough to intuitively identify some demographic processes which can later be tested. And again, the point, and Johan would certainly agree, and he would certainly stress that again and again when he talks about the PCA, this is purely visual. There are no numbers. So this is the, the first step of any ancient DNA analysis. You do a PCA, and then you see some patterns and you test them, okay? So here, it's just showing you what is happening. Okay, so again, what you can see is in the background is modern reference genomes. And this is just showing the um, isolation by distance process, which I was talking about before. Uh, so you can see on the right-hand side, uh, so Caucasus uh, is close to uh, Western Asia, uh, Iran, uh, Near East, uh, uh, and then Cyprus, somewhere in the center. And... Um, as you progress, you see uh, Southern Europe, uh, and then you arrive into kind of like Western Europe and, and uh, Eastern Europe, more like Russia. And so you see a genetic variation here, and isolation like this is the process. Interestingly, there's a little cluster outside here, the uh, Sardinians, which have always attracted a lot of, uh, lot of attention. Okay, so using this particular space, we can now project the ancient genomes. But we need this modern space to be able to project them. Okay, so it's important to, to do this. Uh, so now, the gray symbols that you see on the left-hand side, uh, so that's why I printed this so that you could also see them. On the left-hand side of the PCA, these are all the hunter-gatherers from across Europe. And they are from the seventh millennium, the sixth millennium. Some of them even overlap with the first farmers, okay? But they fall completely outside 
the uh, distribution of modern Europeans. And there's a line uh, from, uh, if you go from the bottom to the top, from uh, Western hunter-gatherers to Eastern hunter-gatherers. Okay. Then when we look at the first farmers, and they are the ones in blue now, okay, what we see is that the, the first farmers from the Aegean and the Anatolian basin, they fall at the completely opposite end of that PCA. And, um, and the reason for this is, well, we, do, we, don't, we don't completely know, but it, it looks like they are different, I mean, they are different people. Uh, so they are coming from, from the Near East, first of all, uh, from Anatolia. Uh, maybe they experienced a strong drift, so there may be population genetics processes that explain why they also look slightly different at PCA level. But what we see is, that even Central European and even Western European early farmers, they are very close on that PCA to the first farmers of Anatolia and the Aegean Basin. Okay? So uh, as, you, as you progress in time, the first farmers of Anatolia are here. And in the middle Neolithic and the late Neolithic, you are a bit further here, so you're a bit drifting towards the hunter gatherers. So it looks like there is, over time, a bit more admixture with... Uh, hunter gatherers in Europe, but it's still marginal. So really what you see here is whereas isolation by distance is important in modern Europeans, it looks like in later prehistory, migration was quite, quite an important phenomenon. And that may also be linked to the fact that we are dealing with small populations and, and other things. There are many reasons. Um, now, in the third millennium BC, we see a second uh, migration happening, which is also interesting. Um, which uh, you can see this like uh, green circles. Uh, so they are somewhere. I mean, if you had to say isolation by distance between the eastern Antagazras and the Caucasus Antagazras, okay, and they are coming from the Pontic Caspian steppes, for uh, southern Russia and uh, the Ukraine. Uh, and we see their migration into uh, Europe. So it looks like a second migration is happening in the third millennium BC, maybe the steppe pastoralists. And then as they uh, move into Europe, them or maybe other steppe populations from uh, the Pontic Caspian steppes, we don't know. It looks like they admixed with local Neolithic communities in uh, Europe. Okay, so for later prehistory, it looks like there were at least two big uh, migrations uh, happening. And now, and you can already see it on your, on your diagram, uh, we wanted to see where Lepanskivir fits. So at Lepanskivir, uh, I mean, again, this is the work of my colleagues, we had 34 individuals uh, which had produced full, partial, or only mitochondrial DNA information that we could use for, for this uh, study. And in total, about 100 uh, samples from the Iron Gate. So it's quite, quite a large number of individuals for these ancient DNA studies, which tend to be on very low numbers of uh, individuals. So when we look at this, uh, what we realize is that the Iron Gate hunter gatherers cluster, in fact, near the uh, Western hunter gatherers, which is interesting. But Lepanskivir, Lepanskivir is doing something weird. Uh, and so at Lepanskivir, we see, so these are the uh, red symbols, uh, we see some individuals at Lepanskivir who look like uh, first farmers, and some individuals, genetically speaking, and some individuals who look more like iron gates on the gatherers, and then we see some admixture, uh, so maybe first or second or third degree, um, so, sorry, third generation, uh, of admixture between the first farmers and uh, the hunter-gatherers. Okay, so it is, it is a very incredibly complex uh, picture. Um, yeah, and we, and so as I said, like we were able to, to look at this in more detail. And this, uh, I mean, this is where also my, my work fit in as an archeologist. I, what I did is essentially contextualize the ancient DNA work that was being done in uh, the lab that I worked in. Uh, so first of all, we looked at who is, you know, uh, genetically male and who is genetically female. Very simple. I mean, with genetics, very simple to do that. And what we discovered is among those individuals that are genetically close to first farmers, 
uh, two of them are, fem uh, are female and four of them are uh, male. Okay? So you can see already this idea of Neolithic women joining a Mesolithic settlement that did not really work anymore, just based on that. Um, another thing, and this is again the work of uh, Johan Dickmann, this is now looking at ancestry proportions. Again, very complex. I don't want to go into this. Uh, but there are about 100 uh, genomes that we included in this analysis where uh, we assume that there are two populations because we see on PCA it looks like there are two populations. And we looked at, um, again, where they fall in terms of ancestry. Are there like 100% iron gates on the gas, whatever that means, 100%, or 100% more on that Aegean Anatolian uh, ancestry. And what we see is that Lipensky via a process where some fall on one side, some on the other side, and we see that admixture process happening uh, in situ uh, at the site. And among those individuals who look like they had both parents who were Aegean migrants, we have a child that was uh, eight years old that was buried within one of the uh, trapezoidal houses at Lepensky Vier. So already that meant to me it's not just women joining a Mesolithic settlement, so there are also men, there are also children. Could it be whole families maybe moving to the site? Could it be that this site, which is traditionally interpreted as a Mesolithic settlement, may in fact be something else, maybe a, like a first farming community, but a weird one, uh, where there was indeed some admixture with the local population? Yeah, we'll, we'll go to this, uh, but when we see, um, when we look at what was happening phase by phase at Lepensky Vier, uh, so going from, uh, so you remember there were three phases. There was a Mesolithic phase, a uh, transition phase, and then Neolithic phase. So in the Mesolithic phase, these are the same colors as before. So red is iron gates on the gas uh, Blue is this Aegean Anatolian uh, ancestry. And there are also indications of mitochondrial haplogroups because for some individuals, we only had the, the mitochondrial uh, haplogroup information. Uh, so, when we look at this over time, we see that um, the transitional phase is the important phase because this is when we see these incoming Aegean farmers moving to the site and they seem to be admixing with uh, the local hunter gatherers. And then in the final phase of occupation, the Neolithic phase, it looks almost like there's a second population, a second uh, movement of uh, farmers that is almost replacing the, the population there. Okay. Uh, so just to focus on that transitional phase, um, uh, you can see here the, the um, you can see here the, the location where people were buried uh, at the site in that transitional phase, and what you can see is that those people were buried inside the houses uh, or within the settlement. They seem to be this Aegean Anatolian uh, first farmers, and the people buried outside seem to be more the iron gates on the gatherers. Uh, and we also see in terms of diet, it looks like the people buried outside were. Uh, at a more kind of like fishing diet, and the people buried inside uh, the settlement, they were either farmers or they adopted uh, fishing. Okay, so you can see, I mean, this model that was proposed, I think, doesn't work with the evidence that we have. Um, and I think if we, if we go beyond that, there are a couple of obvious conclusions to draw. One is and of course, I mean, that will not surprise cultural anthropologists, culture and genetics never match one one. So uh, in the sense that we have here Aegean farmers who are moving to the site and they're burying their dead in extended supine inhumation. Uh, so that's not a typical kind of practice for early Neolithic farmers. And uh, we also see them maybe adopting the local kind of um, uh, practices, uh, which, is, which is interesting. Okay, and uh, this is of course clear because we know that um, uh, cultural transmission is far more complex than genetic transmission, which is about vertical kind of parent to offspring uh, transmission. But I think once we have said that, uh, I think we should not ignore the broader point, which is that it looks indeed like migration was involved in the diffusion of some Neolithic practices like the ones I talked about before. Uh, and you could say agriculture and early village societies in Europe, they seem to be associated, even at Lepensky Vier, with the arrival of Aegean Anatolian uh, first farmers. And we see a kind of migration of sedentary farmers, which is maybe linked to that Neolithic demographic transition. Uh, so we have a rapidly expanding population, so that may be the reason, so it may be a very particular point in time. 
Uh, and you could ask, are residential and construction practices a reliable marker for the arrival of planetary and first farmers? And that still needs to be tested. Okay, and now I, I know I'm running out of time, so I will make it very quick. Uh, you have time. I have time, okay. Uh, so so I, I promised that I would go back to that uh, diffusion controversy of the 1920s. Because uh, I think you can see all of the problems with the concept of diffusion if you go back to that debate, that original debate from the 1920s. <laughs> Uh, so, these are the figures that were involved in that uh, controversy. So, on the left-hand side, uh, you see Crafton Elliot Smith, uh, the eminent neuroanatomist. Uh, he was from Australia. He was uh, the director of the anatomy building at uh, University College. And uh, he's probably mostly, relate, uh, mostly remembered today as one of the most important figures of the British uh, school of diffusionism. And their ideas was that everything came from Egypt, like all of those practices were uh, yeah, coming from Egypt. I'll, I'll show you some maps in a second. On the right-hand side, uh, you see Bronislav Malinowski that I probably don't need to introduce here, but just to say is, of course, one of the founding figures of uh, modern uh, British uh, social anthropology. And um, so Malinowski was based at the London School of Economics. So you can see it was an institutional uh, thing, partly. And then Gordon Schall at the center, um, the foremost prehistorian, as I said before, originally from Australia. And he, um, and he was a librarian at the, at the REI in 1925, and then he had a stellar career, and he wrote a lot of uh, important books in, in prehistory. Okay, these are the important figures that I will mention now. And that diffusion controversy resulted in a book, in a small book, called uh, Culture, the Diffusion Controversy, published in 1927. You can read it in, I don't know, maybe half an hour. Uh, and the point is very simple. Grafton Elliot Smith said, yeah, it's one origin for every innovation. So innovations are only, only appear in one particular place in the world, and it's one person who is responsible for it. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and this idea was early culture, and that included agriculture, by the way, you will see in a second, uh, spread by migration from, uh, from places like Egypt. Okay? And Malinowski, said, well, that doesn't really work. So whenever one culture borrows from another, it always transforms and readapts the objects or customs borrowed. Uh, so it was more about the context. It was not about uh, context so much. It was about acculturation, if you like. And culture, he said, was neither invented nor diffused, but imposed by the natural environment. So if you wanted to summarize, one is diffusion by migration, and the other one is diffusion as adaptation. I show you these maps because I, I want to compare with what we are doing today. Uh, so here, uh, this is an early map from uh, Elliot Smith called, um, in this book, The Migrations of Early Culture. And it's showing an early culture cycle, what the Austrians called Kulturkreis, um, where you cannot really read, so I'll just show you those practices. He's talking about practices like mummification, like the building of megaliths, uh, like uh, sun worship and that kind of things. He finds all of them together in Egypt and then he finds them in isolation in different parts of the world and he says they must all come from, uh, from Egypt. So, of course, this is completely crazy. This is this hyper-diffusionist uh, thing and we don't want to go back to this. Uh, I can also say that at the time this was incredibly popular. I mean, people were, this was, this was like paleogenetics today. It was incredibly popular. Um, and in fact, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, who paid the um, uh, anatomy building and the, the medical school at uh, University College, they invested a lot of money in that kind of, uh, in that kind of work, okay? Uh, so this is another map, which is maybe more interesting for us, where uh, William Perry is another of that hyperdiffusionist uh, school. He showed the origins of uh, farming, and you see a kind of like worldwide expansion of food, produ food production, and uh, you see spatial boundaries between food producers and food gatherers. Uh, and I think that really, 
I mean, again, it's crazy because we know today that there are several parallel centers of invention of agriculture or domestication and so on. But that really strongly influenced people like Gordon Schild. So when he wrote about the Neolithic Revolution, we know that he was an assistant uh, on that, he worked on that volume, The Growth of Civilization. So he got this idea of a spatial division between food gatherers and food producers from this kind of work. But this was the idea uh, at the time. You could contrast this with the work that Malinowski was doing among also uh, farming communities uh, here in the, in the Western Pacific. Um, so I think he's remembered also for participant observation and all these methods. And followers, I mean, people who worked with him, like Raymond First, published this book, uh, Primitive Economics of the New Zealand Maori, where it's a different type of cycle. It's about cycles of acculturation. So here you see the introduction of muskets in New Zealand, where uh, it looks like um, the, the, the Maoris, they first have to, so they, they, they are impressed by the new technology, so they want it as well. And so what they have to do is they have to change their economy, so they change their mode of production, so that they can, first of all, have some resources that they can uh, exchange with uh, the, the traders, and then gradually they kind of shift the economy, and the idea is that at the end, their, um, their, their, their institutions and so on will kind of dissolve. Uh, so, so, I mean, you can see the contrast between these two types of approaches. And Gordon Schild, he tried to do a kind of moderate position, and so he, he he was not in agreement with either, uh, which is very interesting, but he kind of used one against the other. So you can see on the left-hand side, he says something against Elliot Smith. He says diffusion is not an automatic process like infection with a disease. And then on the right-hand side, he says, yes, but visits from European traders will not teach the Trobrian Islanders how to make safety matches or to build chapels in brick. Some transfer of population is implied. Okay, so he's trying to keep the balance. And I would say archaeology has probably proceeded prehistoric archaeology from that moderate diffusionism. So you could, in fact, trace some of the differences between our disciplines from uh, this particular debate. Uh, now, I mean, my, my personal view on diffusion is that once we have said there is diffusion, we haven't said very much at all. I, I think that's, I mean, it's interesting that there is diffusion, uh, but I think that says very little, in fact, about how people interact and so on. I think that was the main problem from the work of Elliot Smith. It was decontextualized, but it was also not, maybe not so interesting. Uh, so if we look back at uh, Lipanski, and I'll, I'll finish uh, in a second, I mean, we see a process here of interaction between people at the site. And what we know also is that even people who are buried together, they are not closely biologically related. This is one interesting aspect. So we, we detected no first, second, or third degree kinship relationship. My colleagues call it kinship, but it's, I mean, physical kinship. Uh, and so we see, no, um, we see no biological relatedness, first or second or third degree, even be, between people who are closely uh, buried together. And I think, I mean, that question of kinship is one aspect where I think we could really learn a lot more from, also from social anthropology. And the same, I mean, that idea of uh, cultural syncretism. When I was working on Lipanski Vir, I was reading uh, Robert Hayden and his idea of antagonistic tolerance, uh, because you could say, I mean, of course, people are interacting at the side, maybe everyone is happy, uh, but maybe it's actually a more competitive process because some people have access to agriculture, others not, apparently. Uh, so, and some people are buried within houses, some people buried outside. Maybe there are subtle differences, in fact, uh, that are expressed there. Uh, I just want to point out that all of the imagery at uh, Lipanski is they have the sad faces, and I think it's noted quite, quite often when you look at, uh, at these pictures, but anyway. Uh, and at this point, I should probably stop. And I, I mean, there are so many people I, I would like to thank here. Um, I try to cram them all into one particular slide, which is impossible. Uh, so I just want to single two. I want to really thank uh, Katie Meu, who helped with, also with this presentation, and she's here today. And I want to thank my colleague, uh, Johan Dickmann. And I especially want to thank my parents, who are sitting here at the back today, uh, who have been supporting me over the years. Uh, and if you're interested, these are a few selected publications uh, related to, to this project. Thank you.
Thank you so very much indeed. I didn't know an hour could pass so quickly. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you. I know there are questions in the audience, and I'll come to David if nobody else does. Are there any questions for Maxine, please? Yes. Yes, I, we, we could, we could, we, I, I, I suppose we could say that, but I, I think it wasn't just women. Uh, it was also men, it was also children, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Your question in the room. Yeah. But, but there, are, there are certainly archaeologists who look at this. Yes, well, I have to say, I, of course, I mean, that's, that's an important... Yes, I, ca I can maybe answer this because part of part of the reason why diffusion, I think, fell out of fashion, mm. uh, especially with the work of Elliot Smith and others, is because it was uh, almost a missionary kind of way of looking at the world, right? It was these Egyptians are coming with uh, this technology and so on from Egypt, uh, so they. Yeah, it was almost a kind of colonization, colonizing way of, of looking at, at prehistory. Uh, I think that was certainly the idea with, with some of that work. For, for my work, I, I think the problem that we have is European agriculture originated in the Near East. So this is a kind of focus that we've been working on since people like uh, Gordon Schall. Now, if we looked on a, on a global level, uh, I think we would see we would see also very interesting things because farming expansion happens in different directions. So from the Near East, we know that it also expanded eastwards towards India. It also went to the south. Uh, so there are different, uh, different things. And, and by the way, uh, and this is complex, but if we looked on the PCA here, uh, what we know is in that origin center in the Near East where domestication is happening, it looks genetically quite diverse so it's not all the people are not here so it looks like there are several populations in that diverse kind of kind of near east although that's very much in flux because um, as you know dna does not preserve so well in hot places so there are not so many genomes from the near east yeah thank you Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question, I'm sorry. Uh, because now it's about Boas and Malinowski. Yes, the, the critique of Boas and Malinowski to the Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I can answer this question. I apologize. I, I think, yeah, apologize. Do you, you imply that the, that the incoming farmers 
others did bring a clear culture with them? I think so. I think so. I think there are a few Neolithic practices, was well, a few practices related to the house, which maybe have to do also with, uh, I mean, agriculture, storage, and so on. Maybe all of this came as a package. So I still believe, yes, I believe that the, the few migrants who came, they are the ones who bought these practices, yeah. And therefore, the local population then weren't really given a choice whether they would accept them or not. Which is not, so it's, it's an anti manoski interpretation in many ways. <laughs> we're not saying that, 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 so what we're not saying is the local population had, had said they could take this bit, for except this bit. They're just saying, hi, we're here now. We're bringing our, our, our way of life with us. And, and, we're going to, and, and we're going to have to share the same space with you, like it or not. It's my interpretation. So, so yeah, so, so, so I think the important point is that for a long time the settlement of Lepanskivir was interpreted as foragers becoming farmers. Yeah. But what we see is the foragers are not becoming farmers. They are not. It's the, the farmers who are actually adopting fishing. But is that so, is that so weird? Uh, I mean, if you go in Serbia now, I have a good friend from Serbia whose father is always fishing in Danube, uh, get this huge uh, fish. So, I mean, you can have farmers who also fish. With the new fields, they haven't got much choice. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you at the back. Yeah. Yes, I'm very interested in that um, To what extent is your work still work in progress? And, or have you concluded, or how much further has it to go? Um, well, it depends what you're talking about. Uh, about Lepanski Vier, or? Yes. About Lepanskivir, it's published. It, it was published uh, a week ago. Uh, and uh, yes, yes, I, I am waiting for angry emails, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I just had a, an interesting question. Um, so, you know, the Lepanskivir is a as you try and reverse questions and flip things around. And um, I was just interested in the actual motivations of people. and. When we have this idea of migration and the Neolithic and it's being brought in, and whereas what you see there, that there's something much more complicated and people are adopting other ways of living, that we always assume, I guess, that the Neolithic is like this great thing and people want to spread it and it's like a positive thing, but why not sort of look at the motivations of those populations incoming who may be coming in and seeing a way of life that actually looks quite nice um, and they're quite happy to become part of that but not lose some of their identity rather than um, sort of bringing something that was an advance, if you see what I mean, it's much more about context, you know, that maybe yep. this way of life in the Iron Gates is quite nice. I believe it can be quite nice because they settled in this environment. Yeah, exactly. uh, so I, yeah, for sure it is. It is nice. Um, I mean, what I have to say is, when I was in Vienna, uh, there was a colleague from cultural anthropology who said a story. Maybe you know him. I, I cannot remember his name now, but uh, he was working in a, in a place, I think, in Southeast Asia, uh, hunting, hunting and gathering community, and it was quite dangerous. Uh, so they had to go as two people going there because uh, these were also m mobile foragers. And he said that they tried one year to bring uh, pictures of like the Eiffel Tower and things like this to these people and look at their reactions. And they were like, what is that? We don't care. Yeah? And then they tried to bring pictures of other foragers from <laughs> other parts of the world and then they were like, Wow, that's nice. They have like uh, nicer technology than we have, and so on. We want the same thing. So maybe, maybe in a way, this uh, idea of like foragers becoming farmers. I mean, for sure, they became farmers in the Near East. It was a long process for them to become farmers. But in Europe, uh, when they were confronted with uh, like a Neolithic package and everything coming together, already organized, you know, domestic plants, domestic animals, uh, the house, and so on. Maybe it was overwhelming. Maybe they didn't want to be part of it. Um, or maybe they wanted to continue their way of life. I don't know. Uh, maybe they had no, no incentive to, to become farmers. I don't know. Amanda, do you have the last question? No. Are there any more questions in the room? Yes. Okay. Fascinating. I think it's really nice to, to just remind everyone of the importance of contextualizing all this thing to me. Yeah. One of the things that strikes me about the issue of contextualization is often it's often focused, of course, on on the migrants and the incoming and, and, and former populations and the gatherers and how that happens. But I, 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 I'm curious, 
if whether you've thought about the larger conditions under which migration happens in the first place, you know, why are people actually leaving Anatolia or whatever? And of course, the problem is, of course, we're dealing with such a large time scale, and any kind of models that we have of migration that are taken from whatever kind of group or whatever, to what extent are they actually Yes, I, I, well, I believe, I believe this has to do with demography. Uh, I mean, Stephen Shannon, who is here today, is, I mean, has written quite extensively on this, but uh, I, I, I do think that there is a kind of Neolithic demographic transition. So with the agriculture and so on, you see, uh, uh, you see an, an increase in populations. So maybe, I mean, part of what we see is the fact that um, farmers have so much more children than uh, the foragers, I mean, the incoming farmers. Uh, and this is why also, I mean, there's this slight contradiction of a migration of sedentary people. This was always struck me as a, as a contradiction in terms. But on the other hand, if you think about farming communities, they reach a certain size. And then when they become larger, I mean, people have to leave and they have to go somewhere else, uh, which at Chateau doesn't work very well because there are something like 4,000, 5,000 people living together. But in, uh, part, in places like Greece, uh, we know that the Neolithic settlements are all about the same size. There are like 200, 300 inhabitants on one side. So there must have been limits. Uh, it must have been a kind of like budding off process. So at some point, the side is too big, the village is too big, and some people have to go elsewhere. Uh, so I think this it has to do with demography, and I, I think this is where ancient DNA probably has a lot to contribute now and also in the future, because it was all about migration, these early studies. Uh, but now, I think with higher coverage genomes, um, you can start to look at demographic processes. You can look at things like bottlenecks. You can look at, uh, yeah. Other population genomics process drift, uh, founder effect, and so on. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much Thank indeed you. for an Thank absolutely you so much. fascinating lecture. <laughs>